Hello everybody, how are you? For many of you, you're not used uh, for, uh, to me, you're not used to listen to me speaking in English here, but this is my first life in English, not in Portuguese, because today we have a very special guest, um, and I opened up my Saturday uh, just because of timing. Timing is, uh, my guest is in Israel, in Tel Aviv, right now um and so we are i think from brazil it's about six hours ahead of brasilia time um and nine hours from me so it's 9 p.m in tel aviv right now i don't know if you're familiar with Hagai shaham uh but he's a phenomenal violinist and i don't use this word very often um, if you do a, a, a short, quick look uh, on Google, um, on YouTube, and you listen to anything that he has recorded there, it's just amazing, unbelievable. He has th that kind of old sound. That's th it's not old for me. It's the sound that I look for uh, in a violinist. Um, um, not only amazing chops, you can play anything, um, but a very intelligent mind, beautiful style of playing. And I'm gonna, oh, I see Professor Shaham. I don't know how to address him, but I'm gonna ask him. So thank you for joining me today in this live English version with Hello, Mr. Shaham, Professor. Hi, Camilo. Hi. Nice How to you? see you. How should I address okay. you? I, I, want, I want to address well, you. Well, it's, <laughs> it's Haggai. It's okay. That's my, Haggai? my name. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> it's an honor, a privilege. Uh, I'm a great admirer of you, of your playing. Um, and uh, not many of you, of, of my listeners, my viewers here know, but I... I listened to you live when I was about 15 years old in Porto Alegre. You're playing Paganini, Concerto Number no. One, and it was just yes. an unbelievable experience for me because I wasn't expecting at all. At that time, we didn't have YouTube. I didn't have many CDs. It was harder access. So when you were there, I was just like, "Oh my gosh, who is this guy?" <laughs> so it's a it's a great honor <laughs> to have you here. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and and for my listeners, for my viewers as well, I believe. Well, very happy to, to be virtual in Brazil. Yes, I was actually just Googling uh, at you and putting on YouTube, and I found a recording of uh, a piece by Hubai that you played in Campos do Jordão in 2012. That's right. Was that right. the last time you were in Brazil? or? No, no, I was several times after. Actually, I played... Uh, same piece I played with uh, Osses in uh, in Sao Paulo. I played uh, Bloch, uh, Bal Shem Suite, and two Sandela Charda, three concerts in uh, Sao Paulo. This was after, and I was several times after this festival uh, in different places Sao Paulo, in Rio, in Chamber Music Recital Orchestra. Yeah. But unfortunately, I didn't come back much to Porto Alegre. Since. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I left Porto Alegre many many years ago, but uh, while I was there, you know, it was such such an experience for me, especially as a as a teenager violinist. Uh, and at that time, I was actually working on Paganini Number no. One, so I was blown oh. away. <laughs> I want I well, want our, our viewers to know a little bit more of you, but the stuff that's not on your bio because they can read your bio. I put your bio here in my profile. I, I want to know, um, first of all, what attracted you to the violin? Is it, was yeah. it family? Was it listening to someone? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, uh, so first of all, about my bio, I don't know what's written because I didn't read it for like 20 years. So, yeah. <laughs> I took it from anyway, um, university. Oh, Stony Brook, okay, good. So that's eight <laughs> years, okay. Um, my father is a musician, uh, he, he's uh, retired now, but music teacher. So as a kid, uh, since I remember, I heard music at home. So he was 
both a singer, but also he played uh, string instruments like uh, violin and viola. So he used to have and still plays every week in amateur quartet. So my first memories of music are uh, listening to this great chamber music. And actually, when I was three, I think, um, I remember that he took me to the Carmel, Carmel Mountain uh, for chamber music uh, session with friends. And it was late in the evening and I fell asleep. And then I woke up because it was the intermission. You know, they had the coffee and cake. And at 10 in the evening, they started this piece, you know, and the Mozart string quintet in G minor. Mm -hmm. And I came back home and I couldn't fall asleep. This melody never left me. Wow. And I remember, I remember vividly standing on my bed, looking outside the window at the tree. It was uh, springtime, about same time as the years now in Israel. And I remember this melody every time I heard in the radio, I said, oh, that's a piece you played that day. <laughs> so then when I was uh, five, I started to take violin lessons from my dad. Uh, he taught me how to read music and we had very successful two lessons. And then I stopped because we had a fight. <laughs> so I stopped playing when I was five and two lessons. <laughs> uh, and then when I was six, uh, my dad took me to a teacher who is not from the family. Uh, and I had a really very nice time with, with my teacher. He was a uh, violinist from the Haifa Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So he was a student of a student of Leopold Auer. Wow. And I remember that he... He was such a kind person, and, and he had a beautiful son, and always when he touched his violin and he played something, I said, I would like to play as beautiful as his sound. So this was a very, very important influence on me. And then when I was 12, um, I moved to Ilona Fehel, the great professor who yes. was a teacher, Shmuel Ashkenazi, Pinka Zuckerman, Shlomo Mintz, and many, I many other... I, I want to talk to her uh, about her, but... Um... It's interesting how um, many violinists uh, start with the appreciation of sound and how beautiful the, the instrument sounds. And that, yeah. that I think I think you uh, you answer what I wanted to listen from you. You know, because I think it's common to, to a lot of a lot of us. Um, did you did you find any influence directly from our to your teacher there, or you were too young to notice anything? When you're young, you don't you don't know anything. You just you just like it and you play and you do it naturally, hopefully, and that's it. And what, as you grow older, you start to understand and to analyze and to compare. So you know, when I was twelve, I just moved from how to say not amateur playing, but less demanding uh, school of my first teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I played in tune and I played correctly in the hands, but it did not push me really. And when I came to Ilona Fair, she threw me straight to very deep and cold water. Mm. And right away I needed to perform and the first already, uh, immediately after changing a little bit in the technique and explaining some things I didn't know, she said, okay, you have uh, three months to prepare uh, two pieces, uh, road concerto and Bach concerto, and you need to play it for a masterclass for Isaac Stern and Dorothy Delay, uh, which will be also videotaped, recorded in Jerusalem. And if, if you play well, you'll stay my student. So that's my beginning of my studies with her. So no <laughs> discounts, straight to the point, you are not good enough, uh, she, she go to another teacher. Wow. This was her, this was her philosophy uh, at that age. And she was 78 at the time. So okay. she didn't have much time. And she was already, you know, she had very good results. She didn't want to spend, to uh, waste time with other students who are not talented. That's right. That's right. So, and uh, did, you, um, did you know immediately that you wanted to be a violinist when you started studying with her? Or it took you a, a while? Well, I knew that I liked it enough to uh, stay her student. Okay. It means that it, uh, you need to invest a certain amount of hours and to practice for every lesson like it is the most important thing in your life and to perform as good as she can expect from you. 
uh, the more you do it, the more part of your life it becomes. Uh, and then, you know, there are other external motivations like winning a competition and getting a scholarship and yes. uh, succeeding in concerts. So when this happens, uh, you feel, you know, maybe you are not so bad as you thought. <laughs> and then you don't want to give it up. And I gave up already several things. You know, I, I love to play ping pong. I took, you know, I was not in a league or anything, but okay. I used to play. And I used to play pretty seriously chess when I was... Uh, 12 and 13 and actually this is you know i won two uh championships in, in chess wow. and interesting about interesting about feher she loved chess she used to play you know whenever and she had always a chess board in her uh living room mm -hmm. and also cards solitaire <laughs> so every time a student came she would test him to see if he's, he's intelligent enough <laughs> and she would play chess against him and it happened to be that at that time, when I came to her, this was my peak of my chess uh, level. I knew opening by heart and, you know, I was really into it. And she was amateur. And she wanted to play. And, of course, after a few moves, she's making a mistake that she didn't know. But I tell her, are you sure you want to do that? She says, yes, why? So, well, you know, if you do that, I do this and that, and that I take your queen. Okay, so she takes me. Another move. Says, are you sure you want to do that? Well, why? Well, you know, just made in five moves. And anyway, this was our last game, and she accepted me. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice story, very nice story. Um, did, did you have, um, before we talk about Ilona Feher, I wanna, I, I'm really interested in, uh, in her, but did you already have, like, uh, besides her, uh, did you have like an idol? Did you have someone that you wanted to listen to the to the recording all the time, or a sound in your mind that you wanted to copy? Well, you know, at that time uh, we had uh, well, we had a lot of LPs, uh, long play records mm -hmm. with record player. Yeah. So you know, I would listen to a lot of whatever we had, uh, big collection. I cannot remember at the, at the moment which violinist I liked the most when I was 12. But I remember that when I started to, you know, to become more serious, when I became her student, and then I dropped from chess and ping pong and whatever, youth movement, whatever I dropped. Um, I started to, well, you know, of course, I had my idols, which were her students. So Zuckerman was one of them, followed by Shlomo Mills. Mm -hmm. I always loved Zuckerman's sound. It was very rich and warm and big and everything. I mean, I don't have any, I cannot think at the moment of any, anybody else I like. And then, of course, I loved, I loved Perlman. I had all his records, I think, at the time. Almost whatever I could find, I bought. Mm -hmm. And then I started to listen more carefully to the old guys. Heifetz, mm -hmm. uh, who, by, by the way, was the same age as my teacher. Wow. Uh, and Sigeti and Chrysler playing and Elman, but this was a bit later. But first, mm -hmm. I think, was Zuckerman, Perman, you know, people I could relate to who were closer in age, and I, you know, looked up to them. And Shlomo Mintz, of course, who was the young, uh, you know, success out of uh, Feher's school. He was 10 years older than me, still is. <laughs> Um, so, of course, this, these were my idols. And then, you know, in a certain time, I started to play slower, twice slow, the LPs, so I could hear all the glisses, you know, when they play medicine contract, it was... Mm. And I learned a lot from this. And, you know, it sounds great, even as, as a cellist who plays slowly. <laughs> Many of the others fail at this uh, stage. So you, ha you had a, a Heifetz phase, so we could say that? I had a what? A Heifetz what? Heifetz phase. Phase, oh. yeah. Yeah, well, ab absolutely. I mean, I think the phase is uh, ever going. <laughs> you know, Heifetz, Heifetz is Heifetz. You know, you have all the violins, then you have Heifetz. Yes. It's a category of its own. 
and I'm not comparing anything with it. There are great violinists no. and great musicians and whatever, and there's Dave, it's, I mean, you can like it or not like it, but for sure he is a, a phenomena of, I don't know, one in how many millions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Unique, unique and, player. Amazing. Yeah. And I think, I think one can, even if you don't like his interpretation, one can learn a lot by listening to his facilities and imagination and flexibility and, you know, I, I can go on and go on. And you can recognize yeah. him after two notes, you know, between every two notes, he puts a little stamp, J-H. That's right. That's right. It's, uh, <clears throat> uh, your, your teacher, Ilona Ferrer, uh, was she big into communicating uh, style and sound to her students? Because it seems to, to yes. that Zuckerman and, and Mintz and yourself, you have not the same sound, of course, but something that's uh, particular. Well, she had, how to say, red lines that one should not pass. So intonation, posture, holding the violin and standing, and sound. So she always said to us, and rhythm also, very important. But she said also, you know, the first thing is the sound. Because you can have a good rhythm and good intonation. You can be the most musical. If you don't have a nice sound, nobody wants to listen to you. It's like a singer. Yeah? You have a good voice, beautiful voice. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Look at Misha Elman. He could fill a hole. He could fill Carnegie Hall with playing open strings. Or, a, you know, a concert of scale. Because it sounds the golden sound of Misha Elman. Um, and then intonation and a lot of temperament so she would push you to your limits never be boring if she said this is boring this was great insult great and she would say it she would say she would go you know on the coach you know she sat on the chair she says even this chair has more soul than the way you played now or even my dog, she had a dog, Pookie. He, is, he plays better. You know, things like this. It's just say, oh my God, what did I do wrong? So it was all the time to please her. And she did. And this is very interesting. And I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm very, very friendly. I admire and, and a good friend of Shmuel Ashkenazi. And he was her very first student. And I was the very last student. I mean... I was the older student of her class when she passed away mm -hmm. in 1988. And I tried to, I interviewed him and I, I compared versions of same teacher so many years apart. Mm -hmm. And she changed a lot in, in many things and some other things stayed the same. So she became less rigid and she would give different fingerings to every student. When I when I was uh, her student, I remember a colleague of mine, very excellent violinist, Jonathan Verick. He teaches now in uh, uh, Ottawa, as a professor at Ottawa in Canada, and we were his younger year than me. And I remember he played solo with a Israel Philharmonic uh, Mendelssohn concerto, and I went to hear his playing his concert, and I sat next to Feher, and he played just you know different fingerings and points what I did, and when she did not allow me to do a glissando. He did this glissando. And I said, wow, that's amazing. Because it was on a highest level, but completely different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wish you know, I could do the same with my students, to give them this flexibility to, to find their own voice, to help them to find their own voice, and not to just give same fingerings to everybody and just play the way I do. And that's my inter that's interpretation. Now, about your question, she, she did not, she, she had also red lines in style. So she did not want you to do glissandi in Bach and mm. to play too heavy here and Mozart was more delicate. But she was not a, how to say, musicologist or a theoretician. She taught and felt everything from her heart. She had great instincts, but she would not give explanations. And the talented students, 
uh, found it. And then she gave us, I think, the uh, tools to keep growing later. So we played very well. We played, uh, you know, very intense, good sound, good technique, everything. Uh, and then I, all my friends, all my colleagues and, and people that I know that studied with her went on and continued, you know, to grow. Of course, she was she was releasing us to go and to study with other teachers as well, which is a very important thing for a teacher. Oh, she, she would actually uh, help you guys to move on to other teachers. Yes, yes. She, she sent, for instance, a very good violinist who studied also same, almost same time as me, Erez Offer, who was a principal in Munich and Philadelphia, and now he's in Berlin, a concertmaster in one of the orchestras. He went for two years to study with Gingold, uh, before coming back to Israel for his military service. I went to study with Emmanuel Borak, uh, who was the assistant concertmaster in Boston Symphony uh, when I was 17 for one year. This was Isaac Stern's recommendation. And Feher approved it and uh, actually uh, she encouraged us to do that. And then we came back to her. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But look, she sent Shmuel Ashkenazi when he was young. He went to Curtis, mm -hmm. went to Timbalist. And she sent Zuckerman to, uh, to Galamian. So she released her good students. She yeah. knew that Israel, with all the greatness of her teaching, and it is a small place, and she wanted her students to, to, be, to do career outside. Mm, interesting. Was she uh, in, uh, in good relationship with Isaac Stern? Yes, yes. yes. Even though, you know, she, she was uh, not an easy, the easiest person, and she would... She would say what she feels sometimes. Mm -hmm. She was a little bit, you know. But uh, yes, she was in a, she, he, Isaac had the greatest respect to her because he knew her students from, from the past and he helped them. And Zuckerman was very close to him. And basically he helped Shlomo Mintz to do his career. Mm -hmm. He was uh, guarding him in New York and helping. They played a lot with him. So... Mm -hmm. Yes, and he knew, of course, Mulas Kenazi, so he had the greatest respect, and we would play for Isaac Stern all the time in master class, all the students um, in Jerusalem Music Center, where he, you know, he built this place, uh, established the place, institute. So I was, uh, in a way, very close to him also. You were close to him as well, okay. Yeah. 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 And um, one last question about Ilona Feher, and then we move on. Did she teach uh, the setup of the violin without shoulder rest, with shoulder rest? I'm just curious about that part. When I studied with her, uh, I used shoulder rest. Um, I remember I used Menuhin shoulder rest, I used Wolf, then I used Kuhn. You know, things changed over the times because uh, new models came and she was trying them. So... Uh, I finished, I think, studying with her with uh, Kuhn shoulder. Wow. Uh, Isaac Stern was very much against it all the time. And he told me, well, don't use it. This, this is only, you know, it's like a prothese. It's external thing that you should put, and it's not part of the body, and it's not natural, and you don't need it, and none of the great violinists use it, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I look at Stern, and, you know, he had no neck, absolutely no neck. He <laughs> head and shoulders. <laughs> so, I, so I didn't say it, but I said, I'll give him a break. And finally, you know, uh, I remember one time that he showed me the difference of sound. He said, you know, when you hold with a shoulder rest, your violin is not parallel to the floor, like Heifetz, you know, if you look at Heifetz holding, you can take the violin from the floor and you just raise it and then that's the way it holds. And with the shoulder rest, you, you get this position. And he played for me, you know, at that angle, and then he played the same at that angle. And I remember the sound was so much more beautiful. And I said, wow, you know, I, I want that sound, the last one. So then I started to build higher and higher on that side, flat on the left and very high on the right. But it worked, but it was not comfortable with jackets and tuxedos and stuff like this because then you have padding. And finally, this was after Fair died, I decided I'm moving on to no shoulder rest. And 
I tested all kinds of combinations. I uh, lowered a little, I, I hired, I, I raised the chin rest, uh, and then I invented this uh, little schmate pad. Bad. It's made up from leather. Uh, it's very thin. And I put it this way under the shirt. Of course, it's good for men. It's not good for women who, who don't have the, you know, the sleeves when they perform. And I put it just to protect my collarbone. Uh, I don't have to play with it, but it's a little bit more comfortable because sometimes this part of the violin uh, hurts when, you know, we hold it too long. Yeah. So I put, and then the holding of the violin is a completely different concept. You don't hold it anymore with the pressure of the head and against the shoulder or the collarbone. You hold it with about five different ways. You hold it uh, with this, you hold it with that, you hold it with this, you hold it sometimes with that, and you hold it with pressure against the neck, and you hold it with any of you know the fingers against the thumb. Yes. So when you move from one to the other, and you, you, you know, you know, you do it automatically, you don't think about this. Um, it's not tiring and it's very, very flexible. So basically you can play, you know, moving everywhere, which you cannot do with a shoulder rest. Shoulder rest actually fixes the violin in one position according to the shape of the shoulder rest and you cannot move much. Um, I, in my class about half play without, half play with, I give them the option um, to, to, to choose what they want. I, I'm not, I'm not so uh, radical like Superman who, who opposes that completely, I heard. But um, I think finally, I mean, you have great violins to play with and great violins to play without. So <clears throat> why to force anybody? But it's good to know how to play without and feel with. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting. Um just relating a, a, a personal experience, uh, I played without or just like a little sponge as well under the violin until I was 15. And then I grew up, grew older and my teacher told, ah, oh, you need a shoulder rest. And then I never looked back, you know. But mm -hmm. after your um, interview with Ruda, I took it out. <laughs> and I'm oh. playing with nothing right now. I'm playing zero oh. and I'm feeling really comfortable actually good i i hope you stay that well for the rest of your playing career yes I, I, I hope i didn't do any damage you know well i do i do feel a little more more discomfort but there is a way of getting around with g string i mm -hmm. i feel like i have to do this more you know so playing paganini mm -hmm. i was trying paganini number one so everything is more a little more con contorted mm -hmm. you know a little more twisted mm -hmm. but it doesn't hurt me in the long run. I just have to get more ready for it somehow. It's, it's a little more effort, but... Well, try try moving the valley a little bit. Uh, try a different angle of the, you know. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm opening much more than I used to, for sure. But then my, my yeah. bow can't be straight. So I have to kind of ah. sometimes bring in, that bring out. <laughs> Your bow, so for this, this is a very simple, grow a little bit your right hand length, you know, so <laughs> extend it like telescopic. <laughs> yeah. So now, now uh, when you went to, when you won the uh, ARD competition, were you a student of Ilona uh, Ferrer or not anymore? No, no, this was after she passed away. Yeah. Um, I went on and I went to study with a Guarneri Quartet in the United States, uh, at Maryland University, basically. So I had uh, both a piano quartet uh, with my friends from Israel. Uh, and also I had a duo with the pianist, Arno Neves, my colleague since, uh, you know, since we were kids. Uh, we played together. So uh, at that time, we prepared a program uh, of uh, duos. It was a very big program. We went to Banff, Banff in Canada, Center for the Arts. Uh, we prepared this million pieces, and uh, this was just before the competition. Mm -hmm. So I was studying with Arnold Steiner actually at the same time. Yeah. Great. Um, and also with members of the quartet. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So today, two of them are still alive. Uh, John Daly, the second violinist, Steiner, the first violinist, and mm -hmm. the two others passed away already, Michael Tree and Sawyer. But they were a big, big inspiration for me, the Gorneri Quartet. I have to say I adored and adore them. They are my heroes, mm -hmm. I have to say. Great. Still, still are. Yeah. And not only my, my whole family. I mean, my three kids, you know, they all play. Mm -hmm. My son, Alice in Curtis, was a Shmuel Ashkenazi in Ida Kalbafia, but he also takes chamber music lessons with Steinhardt. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. So what, what do you think is the role of those competitions? Because I heard you talking with Ruda that you're like not so big on competitions, but you won this one, which is an amazing competition. Um, so what do you think is the role of competitions for younger generations nowadays? Okay, so uh, look, let, let's look at competitions historically in the modern era. Um, the first competition, I think, was Vinyavsky in 1930, whatever, when Jeanette Neveu won. Jeanette Neveu and then Oistra second prize and uh, Temianka third prize, etc. And Ida Hendel was like a kid. She won something also. And then you had Queen Elizabeth and the other competition followed. Mm -hmm. So there was a competition here and then no competition and another one and four years later. Today, uh, if you Google violin competition, probably you have many pages on Google. Oh, yeah. So uh, it is an inflation of competitions. And not only, you have internet competitions. So <laughs> you, pay, uh, you, you pay 100 euros or 150 euros and you send your video mm -hmm. and then they choose few and then, you know, it's like buying a lottery ticket. You have enough people who buy a lottery ticket, they make money. That's right. <laughs> Some people win, but, you know, most of the applications don't win. Yeah. Um, I think that there are several good things about competitions. First is the ambition to win, to prepare. You need to prepare a program. You need to ha you have a deadline. You need to perform it at your best. So this is the number one important thing. And it doesn't matter if you want, you just go and you need to play. So the preparation and expectation is the important thing. Like you have a commitment, you paid 150 euros, you don't want not to go, you want to prepare. Mm -hmm. You buy a flight ticket, you pay for the hotel, you, play, you pay for a companist, etc. So that's one good thing about it. Uh, and you know what? Many good things can happen even if you don't win. Maybe somebody will meet you at the competition. Somebody will be impressed with your performance of a certain piece. Maybe, you know, you can have a career without winning this competition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more than the people who won. There are examples like Ivo Pogorelic. He won second or third prize, I don't remember, in Chopin competition. And Marta Arhrich thought it's unbelievable he didn't win and she promoted him and he made a career mm -hmm. second thing if you're lucky you win something then you have visiting card the visiting card is good for a certain time it doesn't give you more than one seasons of concerts uh, if you are not keeping up to it so it opens doors and it's good on the resume on the cv mm -hmm. but one should not uh, illuse, make illusion that this is enough to win a competition. Because there are so many competitions that, uh, you know, there are every year new winners. So you got the concert last year and this year they're going to invite the new one. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I see people who go from one competition to the other. That's like their hobby from the age of 18 until the age of 30. And they win, you know, third here, second there, sometimes first, then they go to another one, and they keep winning. And, you know, it's money here, money there, but they lose also money, flying and whatever. Um, and then what? They have to do something. They have to play regular concerts. They have to support maybe family. So it's not a, a long career going to competitions one would like to start real life. You know, playing concerts, I, for me, 
I mean, the competition ID, you know, this is like sports. Um, yes. It's not art. It's not the art itself. So mm -hmm. being an artist, every performance is different. Yes. You give your heart. You want to play differently. You don't want to play to please a member of the jury that expect you to play in a certain way. You would like to to be honest to yourself and to the composer and not to the member of the jury. But it is a way of starting a career and it can help a lot. So people will know about you if you win a competition, you are good enough uh, to play concerts and you know, it's good to good selling point. So it's important. Final word is important today. It's important. So you would say to your students, go do the competition, prepare for it. It depends on the person. There are people who are not good at competitions. The pressure will not be good for them. They're, they will not win. They will freak out and, and it's a waste of time. There are people that competition will make them practice and it will be good for them even if they don't win. And there are people who are very competitive and very good and go and win and start their career, of course. I had students like this, yes. Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, in your life as a, as a soloist, um, did you always keep um, chamber music as, as a central point of your life? Because it seems to be that you're really into chamber music. Well... <clears throat> I think that the purest music, in my opinion, is chamber music. In chamber music, you know, the, the purest actually is a, a quartet of singers. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you have the four voices and the second pure is a string quartet. And then you have string trio, and you have piano quartet, then you have, instead of a quartet, you have a piano and a sonata, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is the more intimate and less showy uh, genre of the composers that they could express themselves in them, how to say, more minimalist and uh, a very personal way. So there are so many composers that I can say that the chamber music is the gem of their, you know, I cannot live without their chamber music. And, you know, we can go from yeah. Mozart and Haydn and, and Beethoven, of course, and Brahms and Schubert. And, you know, the chamber music is such a repertoire that if we can do it, why shouldn't we? I mean, it's you, you don't get the intimacy of uh, Mozart's uh, chamber music or Schubert or in a concerto by them. No, and actually... Right. Speaking of Mozart, I, I, I don't want to grade his pieces, but his chamber music, for me, is better than his concertos for violin. Yes, 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 yes. So he has five concertos, but he has so many quartets, and he has 15 uh, mature sonatas, which are unbelievable. When you start to look at it, it's like, wow, I think it's better music than the concertos. Uh, for sure. And, and Beethoven, well, it does, okay, it does okay, have the, the Sinfonia Concertante, which is kind of chamber music and it's fantastic it's like of course wonderful. look Mozart says, look I've, <laughs> you won't hear a bad word from me about Mozart except, <laughs> no, that he died, except that he died too young that's right <laughs> there's no question he's a genius whatever he, he, he touched but yeah. his output and the intimacy and the greatness of his chamber music is uh, fantastic and Beethoven of course and uh, also, the sonatas are chamber music. They are uh, sometimes not regarded as chamber music, mistakenly. But it is mm -hmm. pure chamber music. The piano and violin sonatas are violin and piano sonatas. Absolutely, yeah. And it is uh, part of our repertoire. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Mozart sonatas are fantastic. And it, we usually play that E minor, maybe the G major when you're younger, but then later on you start to feel like, oh my gosh, that A major in the end is just, I, I forget the KV, but it's just... Yeah, five to six A major. Yeah, I, I played, I did a project uh, last season with a pianist composer, Menachem Wiesenberg. We did all the sonatas for video. Oh. 
I mean, it will be, uh, recorded concerts in Jerusalem Music Center. Uh, and hopefully, you know, it will be edited and put together and it will be on YouTube. All the 15. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Beautiful. What is your, um, I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm going to open up for questions from the viewers. Um, what was um, or what is your routine when you are constantly um, concertizing as a soloist or a chamber musician? Uh, uh, doesn't matter. But when you're traveling a lot, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I do have in a smaller scale uh, uh, that uh, dilemma of how much do I keep? Do I do scales every day? Do I just play the music I'm playing right now? What is your routine? Well, the routine is trying to keep in shape. Uh, whatever does it is good. So um, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of psychology as well. So sometimes you have travels that take more than a day with the traveling to the airport and waiting between the flights and then traveling to a different continent. Or for instance, I was in a, uh, a Buenos Aires in, in August. I played with the orchestra, the Philharmonic. So the travel was so long, you know. And then you arrive and you're in a complete jet lag. You arrive six in the morning and you're, you feel like it's middle of the night and you want go to the hotel and then it's anyway so but you need to keep in form you need to keep in shape so you know you cannot do your home routine when you're traveling you don't have the one hour for scales and then etudes and then you know a repertoire so you need to be prepared very much before in advance you need to, to have the pieces really in your hands and what i do i i, I have a, a page on my music stand with the pieces which I play every month, and I see it coming. So I, I start to practice them, not just, you know, the week before, but all the music is in my room. I pile of music, you know, and I change it. And I start to, to practice more and more as I get closer to the concert. And if you have a tour with several pieces, like many pieces, all of them must be in good shape, of course. You're not going to practice on the easy parts as much as on the difficult parts. So when you have limited time, you would touch bits and pieces from those more difficult places. Uh, and with the hope that, you know, you are in good enough shape that even if you don't play for a day or two days, still you can come back as quick as you can. So, you know, at least Franz Liszt said, that if he doesn't practice one day, he feels it. If he practices, if he doesn't practice two days, his friends will hear it, and three days the audience will hear it. <laughs> and he true. was, you know, the the biggest virtuoso at the time. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna um, open up for questions here, um, and the first question is from our mutual friend Ruda. If Haggai uh -huh. would have to choose between Picanha or Farofa, which one would he choose? <laughs> oh, of course, Picanha, because you don't eat Farofa by itself. Oh. And Picanha, good Picanha is, is, is good even without Farofa. So with all my love to Farofa and all, we don't have Farofa in Israel. This is one <laughs> very big disadvantage of the, the thing. But Picanha we have. Yeah. And actually, my son became an expert in Picanha since, you know, I had this Brazilian connection of uh, Abner Landim and, and Simone and Ruda, you know, all those people who understand what uh, Picanha means. <laughs> so my son now, he's doing it very well. Very Thank good. you, all of you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go for the next question. Uh... Oh, this is in... In Spanish, but when are you going to visit Uruguay and Brazil? It's very easy. Whenever I'm invited. <laughs> as All soon right. as I'm invited, I'm coming. This is a, yeah, my very, very dear part of, of, yeah, of my trips are to South America. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so Natalia is asking, um, in Portuguese, but I'll translate, how to plan your career? Oh, 
this is a very very big and long uh, a big one yeah uh, deep deep subject look i think it starts with uh, your dream and then it goes on to reality mm-hmm. so you have potential but then you have to make it uh happen so for instance i give you an example let's say my dream t- today is to be a basketball player in the nba okay mm-hmm. but reality will not uh, let it happen because i'm too old and i'm not so tall mm-hmm. and you know i didn't practice basketball since i was six so um you have to be realistic you have to match your aspirations to reality your wishes and your dreams and then when you think that you can do something oh, push a little bit higher than what you're capable of it's always good you have to be very smart you have to go you have to be determined to do that you have to be in the right time in the right place and to be ready when it comes and then you have to do to be good in the media you have to be good with people all the things that uh, you know will help your career but it is a very deep and very broad question i have a question for you what do you think um nowadays uh is the role of social media for musicians well it's more and more vital mm-hmm. and you know i'm not so big on the social media but you know uh, a few few weeks ago ruda asked me if i'm willing to do an interview on my instagram account and i told him you know instagram yeah i opened it when it was a new application back in you know 1890 and i posted uh, one a uh, photo of uh, saturn through my telescope and this is all i had on instagram so you, you see that i'm not so big but since then i have to say i started to look around a little bit and i spoke today with somebody via instagram and today we're meeting here uh, i have a facebook i started to post more things uh, on facebook i'm going to post more musical things uh, on youtube i uh, recommend my kids to do that because there are three of them that are musicians so they start to post things it is very important today you know even if i have a student who has to study with me uh i google and i look on youtube and i want to hear who's playing on youtube Absolutely. and i'm sure that people in festivals and concert managers promoters orchestras they do the same and you know when i when i uh, asked uh, i started to work with hyperion hyperion records i recorded with them uh, over 11 cities i think um the first thing they asked me to send them live recordings of myself live unedited of concerts because they wanted to make sure that I can perform and be good in the recording which is very limited time you know you have sessions of 2 and 1/2 hours two sessions and that's it so i sent them and they accepted me and today people just look at youtube oh you can play good we ask you for a concert or a recording whatever it's very very important that that's the way the the world is working today yeah. in this business yeah absolutely i agree with you um next question let's see um let me see here do you like astronomy do you believe in aliens <laughs> hey. okay i like astronomy Uh, who did you ask this question how do you know oh. about it oh i took it i took yeah. it off i'm sorry but uh yeah. no i don't so, know actually i don't know um, this person yeah. i have two telescopes at home i love astronomy this was my well i wanted to be an astronaut when i was a, a kid but you know it didn't, didn't materialize yeah um i had a kind of a bad telescope and you know i always wanted to have serious telescopes i interested in optics as well so i have cameras and whatever um i so finally i have now two nice telescopes still i'm amateur but i love to watch the the skies i um 
interesting when I was in Buenos Aires with the orchestra. So there's a violinist from the orchestra also who is a, a astronomer and he makes beautiful photos. So now I follow him on uh, Facebook and uh, we have a mutual, I take also photos, but you know, you look outside and you, you understand how small we are and you know, it's not a, no reason to be nervous in a concert. This is really small. Look outside. And yes, about aliens. Um, yes, of course, I think that uh, we're not alone. This is, uh, I think it's, you have to be really arrogant to think that we are the only ones. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think that we are, there, there was, there were many before and during and after, and we are very, very small in a very big place. And of course, for me, aliens are, are here. So do yeah. you believe they, yeah, they made in contact with, with us, or that's different? <laughs> yes. I mean, look, it all depends on your definition, what is alien? <laughs> alien is what? Uh, somebody who don't understand what it is, or alien is a different entity that, you know, we, we don't see every day. Yeah. Some, you know, angels can be aliens, and aliens can be ghosts, and aliens can be many things. And aliens can be uh, people in different dimension. And aliens can be people, uh, I mean, creatures, uh, who are not uh, contacting us because we are not prepared, because we are too primitive. So, and you know, we have too many unexplained phenomena on Earth that nobody can explain how it happened. And some people say, well, this is gods. And some people say, no, these are aliens. So how come the, the, the pyramids, you know, you have in South America pyramids and then you have in Egypt and then you have in China, and then you find another one under sea. And then pro, one I saw in Antarctica, uh, Google, Google Maps, you know, Google uh, Earth mm -hmm. and many, many other things and crop circles. And yes, actually I'm interested in those things. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh... Let's see. From the same person, what do you do if a student doesn't agree with your own fingerings? I have no problems. I don't impose my fingerings. Um, most of my students, I don't give them uh, fingerings. Do your own fingerings. My students are uh, a academic, academy level. I don't teach young kids. For young kids, you give them the fingerings and no questions asked because, you know, the first stage of learning is imitation. You imitate your parents, you imitate your teachers, and then you start to have your own ideas. Um, for academic or university level students, play your fingerings. If something doesn't sound good and doesn't work for either reason, Either it's not practical and you're entering bad, you know, aesthetics zone, or musically doesn't make sense, I would suggest fingerings. And of course, if the student asks for my fingerings for the whole book, I'm generously, I will scan it and send him the copy, which I do with many of my students. If somebody doesn't agree, good, do your own fingerings, that they'll sound good. Convince me that your choice of fingering is good. And there are many good options. So, uh, you know, a friend of mine studied with Joseph Fuchs. He was a great violinist. He taught at Juilliard. Yes. And Fuchs would tell him, you know, there are many, many good options of fingerings. And there is one bad option. That's the one you chose. <laughs> I, I don't say one of my teachers in Brazil, I don't know if you met him, Marcelo Gersfeld. He studied with uh, Fuchs in, in Julia. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yes. Was a great violinist, Fuchs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, this is a good one. This might take a little time. How do you prepare a concerto even if you have played it many times in the past? So reworking mm -hmm. a concerto. Yes, very good question. 
You know, we we evolve. I mean, we are, we change all the time. Uh, do not expect to have the same opinion about anything um, in three years and as you had five years ago. You will have things that you take with you, but you will view it in a different way. You heard other music, you learn other pieces, you heard other performances of the piece, you, you changed. Mm -hmm. So we start from something that we had already, like you're used to play the Mendelssohn Concerto. So you're not taking a, the notes and start to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Mm -hmm. Yes, you may find yourself inventing a square wheel. You know, it's not so good. Mm -hmm. So you take uh, information which you have and which you're familiar with, and then you add, hopefully, better ideas and better understanding. So, for instance, uh, these days in the corona times, you know, that we are mostly stuck at home, I took a new book of uh, Bach, Solo Partitas and Sonatas, and I started, you know, to make new fingerings the whole book. So some fingerings, I'm using what I did, and some say, wait a second, why did I play that? And why didn't I use the original bow and I change the bow? Why? Because of the edition I used to play from? Or So it is an ongoing, ever, never-ending process, which is very interesting. Um, and the danger, and here I'm saying the danger is that when you study the piece when you are a kid and you played it so many times in a certain way, you make new fingerings, and during the time of the concert, you have to be aware of the new fingering because autopilot goes to the old one. Yes. <laughs> I did a but little project. Believe, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you believe in this new version and you, you think it's better, you'll work on this and you, you will be, that's it. You'll make it yours. And I'm going through that a lot. I have sometimes four layers of fingerings. And, you know, I come back to them and says, oh, this is ridiculous. This is not playable. <laughs> How did I think? You know, therefore, I never write it in a pen, all on in pencils. And I have a very good eraser. It's very important. I did a little project of playing the four first movements of Partita Number no. 2 this week here on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I was playing by memory. And, of course, I changed fingerings. And I had a few memory slips. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I played this so many times. That's the danger, is when you change stuff, it's not, and it's amazing how old fingerings and bowings came to the performance. After like two weeks of practicing it, the other way. Yes. The yes. old way kicked in in the performance, just like, oh my gosh, why did I use the second finger there? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's yes. the never ending. So never ending. Not, if you want to, to try an interesting experiment, Try to play the Alamand or, you know, for instance, instead of a D minor, in C minor. Then you have no more habits of fingerings. You're going to follow a completely different set of uh, thinking uh, rules. Yes. You just follow the relationship between one note and the other. You transpose what people at the time of Bach did automatically. Yeah. So it will free you if you are used to do that, it will free you from your old habits of it's the only fingerings. You will follow different logics. That's great. I, I recommend it to all my students, actually. That's great advice. It's not easy. Not easy. Not easy. At first. Haggai, I'm going to ask call you Haggai. Thank you so yes. much for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and listening to you. I'm a great admirer of your art. And um, I hope to see you soon, either in here uh, or in Brazil or in Israel or s sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It was a very enjoyable conversation with you. All very right. nice questions Thank and, and, and also from, from your friend. Bye-bye. Oh, well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Um, And I'll see you this week. Nos vemos essa semana em português agora, porque eu sei que a maioria de vocês fala português. <laughs> Foi incrível a conversa, né? Thank you so much for those of you that don't speak Portuguese. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I'll see you soon.